Hello and welcome to this very special webcast uh, from the European Movement International in coordination with the European Investment Bank. Uh, this uh, webcast is entitled Investing in the Future of Europe, the Green Deal and the Need to Invest in a Green Economy. This is the 13th event and the second digital version in a series of events with the EMI and the EIB have been holding together across Europe since 2017. My name is Joe Lynham and I present a program on the BBC World Service called The Newsroom, also on Radio 4. Before that, for many years, uh, I was a business correspondent covering the financial crisis, the Eurozone crisis, the Brexit crisis, you name the crisis and uh, I have covered it. Uh, this is, of course, a very worrying time for millions of Europeans. Tens of thousands of people have died due to the coronavirus and countless livelihoods have been ruined. Thankfully, there is a vaccine on the way and the BioNTech vaccine was even funded by the European Union. Today, we will be discussing what Europe could and should look like after the COVID-19 crisis and after we return, <clears throat> return to some sort of normality. The EU has proposed spending more than one and a half trillion euros over the next seven years as part of the special next generation EU, uh, as well as the usual MFF or budget spending. For the first time, some of that money will represent a type of collective borrowing, and it could mean an even deeper integration among member states. But how will and how should the money set out under the EU's Green Deal be spent in order to recover from COVID-19? create jobs, and all the while Europe's highly ambitious climate change targets. Today, we'll be asking two key questions. How should citizens and sectors prepare for the necessary structural changes? And which political and budgetary priorities are necessary to enhance investment in a just, sustainable and green transition that leaves no one behind and allows both European citizens and businesses to benefit? We have a great panel bringing together some of the most senior people in the European Commission and we have experts in the field. Remember, you can also contribute to the discussion. Please post your questions using the facility on StreamYard. It should be on the right hand side of your screen. We may be, not be able to get to all of your questions, but we'll put whatever we can to our panel. Please be nice because everything is on the record. Uh, remember, it's being broadcast live on the European Movement International uh, sites, on their Facebook page, on the YouTube and Twitter, but also on their national channels. So it's not just a central Brussels thing. All the European Movement channels uh, around the continent uh, will be covering this as well. If you wish to comment on Twitter or LinkedIn, please use the hashtag investing in Europe. You can also follow the event on EM International, at EM International, excuse me, uh, on Twitter or at EIB on Twitter. And as I said, be nice because everything is on the record. Uh, let's uh, talk to our amazing panel. Let's start with someone who barely needs an introduction. Franz Timmermans is the executive vice president of the European Commission in charge of the Green European Green Deal. This is the, his second stint as the Netherlands European Commissioner. He's not afraid to take on tough challenges, including the rule of law portfolio and trying to be elected using the Spitzenkandidat system last year. He was born in Maastricht in Limburg, uh, but was educated in Rome. Apart from his native Dutch, Franz speaks fluent English, French, German, Italian and Russian. Embarrassing all the rest of us. But most importantly, and like me, he is a big AS Roma football fan. Forza Giallo Rossi. Um, Celine, uh, uh, excuse me, Thomas Oestros from the European Investment Bank was due to join us, but unfortunately, he's attended a very high profile EIB management meeting and that has gone over. So he cannot, unfortunately, join us. He sends his apologies and no doubt will make it up to us in the next couple of months with the next session of this. Celine Charveria is the executive director of, for the Institute for European Environmental Policy. She has more than 20 years of experience in the field of sustainable development, having worked at the Peterson Institute, Oxfam, and the Inter-American Development Bank in Washington. Celine concentrates on the domestic implementation of the UN's sustainable development goals in Europe. Most recently, she was named this year in the top 100 CSR influence leaders by Ascent Compliance. And Thomas Weitz is a member of the European Parliament from Austria and co-chair of the European Green Party. 
In his work, he is focused on sustainable agriculture, regional production, and healthy food, especially the common agricultural policy, reforming the animal transport directive. When he's not being a politician, he's an organic farmer, beekeeper, and forester, no less. Each panelist will have about four or five minutes to introduce themselves and tell us how they see the Green Deal working out and how it will shape the future of Europe. Please, please, please pose your questions now and don't be shy. As they say in Scotland, shy children get nay sweets. So think of your questions. It's very rare you're going to get access to uh, the kind of panel we have today. Um, hashtag investing in Europe, please, if you're commenting. Let's start with uh, Franz Timmermans. Franz. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's great to have this opportunity to have a discussion about where we're heading uh, out of the pandemic. Uh, I, I do believe we have a unique opportunity, which probably will not come back this generation, to um, combine a number of challenges we have uh, and uh, to make sure we invest in the economy and society of the future. Uh, so what do we combine? We, uh, of course, are faced with the COVID crisis. Uh, people are very much worried about their health, about their loved ones, about their jobs. And we need to face that. Um, the uh, climate crisis is still here uh, and it's not going anywhere if we don't face it. We have a huge biodiversity crisis. We don't talk enough about that. I hope that will change and, and public awareness of that crisis will, will increase. And we're in the middle of an industrial revolution uh, in a world that is changing so fast. So we have now, uh, as you said uh, at, the, at the beginning, we have uh, an opportunity to invest because in July, uh, member states came together. It wasn't easy, but they did come together uh, and showed a high level of solidarity in collective borrowing, in, collective, um, in a collective organization of grants, which will allow us to invest in our society. And the, the one thing that we need to do is to make sure these investments don't become stranded assets. If we invest them in the economy of the past or today's economy without that economy being future-proof, that money will be lost and we will have nothing to show for ourselves when our children and grandchildren uh, take over. So uh, the Green Deal we uh, 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 drew up last year, uh, exactly a year, which was already before the pandemic, our growth strategy, more than ever now is the growth strategy for the European uh, Union. Um, and I believe that if we invest in a circular economy, if we make this shift towards um, uh, 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 emission-free energy uh, generation, if we uh, change our transport systems, if we uh, change our building environment, uh, if we, and this is going to be a big one, if we actually get the common agricultural policy to move in the right direction, then we can. Um, achieve our goal of being a climate neutral uh, continent by 2050. But we can only do that if we take the right steps in the intermediary period. That's why the European Commission has proposed to increase our emission reduction target for 2030 from 40% to minus 55% uh, percent, uh, as compared to uh, 1990. Uh, we've assessed that for impact and it turns out it can be done. But there are three areas where we are particularly challenged and we will have to look at them. It's uh, housing, uh, it's uh, transport and it's agriculture, as I mentioned before. Uh, and uh, the Commission will come up with proposals in the months to come uh, leading up to uh, next uh, summer uh, with um, uh, the, uh, the proposals to make sure that we actually achieve the minus 55%. Uh, it can be done. Uh, I only fear uh, three things, two or three things. The first thing I fear is um, that many people in Europe uh, get the impression uh, that um, it's lost anyway. The climate, the climate crisis is no longer under control. So what the heck? Um, that I think, so climate desperation is one of the things I fear uh, most. The second thing I want to mention is we cannot afford not just for moral reasons, but simply for reasons of practicality and simply of reasons of wanting to achieve something, we cannot afford not to have a just transition. If the transition isn't, isn't just, it just isn't going to happen. So we need to make sure we show that we leave no one behind. And this is a huge challenge, but it can also be done. And the third challenge, and uh, these days at every, every introduction I give, I mention it because I'm really worried about it. The third challenge is to bridge the gap between cities, 
and rural areas. And when I talk about cities, it's it's the big, big cosmopolitan cities, and uh, they they are sort of on a on a on a track of their own as compared to smaller cities and rural areas. We cannot afford to have that. It is causing huge political problems. It's causing uh, social problems and it's causing economic problems. So we need to make sure that the policy we apply also bridges that gap and brings it and bring and brings rural areas and uh, cities closer together. Let me stop here. Well, thank you very much, France. Um, I didn't have to jump in. Thank you very much for some of your issues. I'm certainly going to raise the issue of climate desperation um, uh, with you uh, a little bit later on. But now let's go to Céline Charveria from the Institute for European Environmental Policy. Céline. It's really lovely to be uh, here with you today. Um, um, I seem to have an echo. Do you hear an echo? Uh, it, it, go ahead, Céline. It's, it's working on our side. Okay, good. Um, so... Um, I think it's really key to put sustainable well-being and equity at the center of all European policies, but more specifically the Green Deal, if we want uh, to achieve what uh, VP Timmerman set out uh, to do. And that means we need to have tangible benefits for citizens out of the green transition. We propose at IEP to redistribute pollution dividends if tomorrow we got rid of fossil fuel subsidies, if we doubled carbon taxes, but also doubled other environmental taxes, uh, all of those are very low at the moment, we would uh, put together 381 billion, which we feel could be put to reduce labor taxation and help create jobs out of the green transition. It's also key that we use a labor intensive approach to the green transition. One area I would like to highlight is the need to build a green care economy that fulfills the health needs of the citizens, but also that addresses uh, the challenges of greening the healthcare sector which provides 10% of employment uh, today in Europe. We also need to make sure that people are skilled and are equipped for the economy of tomorrow. We need to make sure that we they have benefits in terms of their health. If you look at uh, mental health, we know from COVID that uh, the mental health burden, which is already very large, 600 billion a year in mental health burden in Europe will only increase. And one way to help alleviate that burden, and this is very much uh, proven by medical studies, is to bring back nature in people's lives. And so restoring ecosystems and making sure that uh, nature is back in Europeans' lives is really important. People also need to be consulted and empowered. That's why we have great hopes for the Climate Pact, and we want to make sure that the Climate Pact will help companies but including SMEs, which are so important for our economy, to feel empowered to take on pledges and play the game of uh, sustainable competitiveness. We also need to have equity, putting equity at the center. In every country, we need to have double benefit policies, not just safety nets, not just a just transition, which are of course important, but making sure that the policies from the get-go, address poverty and inequality. I'll give you one example. If you were to make low-carbon public transport free, that would help the poorest women uh, in Europe who are uh, uh, single-headed uh, households. We also need to have convergence targets between different countries. We cannot leave some countries behind in Europe uh, in, during the green transition because not everyone is equal in this transition as we can see from the size of recovery packages. And last but not least, uh, we need to have intergenerational equity and solidarity. This is why we propose a plan to green pensions, but also to make sure that we uh, um, secure the rights of future generations within European treaties, and that we have a long-term plan, a 2050 plan, for our prosperity that can look at what it is needed in the long term to increase our human capital, our physical capital, but also preserve our natural capital. Thank you. 
Merci, Celine. Thank you very much for that uh, contribution. Uh, and I'll be coming back to you on that idea of free public transport, which I think is quite interesting. Um, I'm going to now go now to Thomas Weitz uh, from uh, the Austrian Green Party. He's a member of the European Parliament. Thomas, Sie sind dran. Thank you very much for the invitation and a pleasure to see Commissioner Franz Timmermans here. Um, yes, I think we're all on the same page that there's an urgent need to invest into Europe's green future. And this is first and foremost because of the climate crisis, which we will not solve with the vaccine or with the medication. This is the crisis that is here and it's here to stay. But even more or even um, uh, as, as I would say same level important for the European economy is the turn to investments on the green side because due to climate change the whole world has to adopt uh, and has to find new ways to counter the climate crisis and if we in Europe are at the forefront of this development of this actually economical new mega trend this will also serve our economy, our industrial production, and at the end create also jobs and workplaces, which we will urgently need, especially after this COVID crisis, because the economical thick end of that crisis is still to come. Uh, so the path towards CO2 neutrality is the one that we have to support with research, with development, uh, but also uh, in, in view of the new uh, emerging global markets. Uh, I, will, I will use my time here to also point a bit of a critical light on where we maybe should not uh, get ourselves irritated by green speech where there's no, not so much green inside. And I will not go too much into the CAP discussion, which may be a painful one uh, for, for Franz Timmermans, for the Commissioner, because even uh, the, the Parliament's proposal, but also the Council's proposal on the CAP, uh, the current proposal, is not fit for a green and uh, climate-friendly future. Uh, it's actually, uh, if it comes in the way as it has been uh, discussed in the moment and decided up to now, uh, it's a huge lost opportunity to solve the crisis. Just giving one example, if we are not replacing artificial fertilizer, which is produced with fossils, basically gas, emitting nitrous oxygen being, being put on the soil, if we're not replacing it through green fertilizers, where plants collect with photosynthesis CO2 out of the atmosphere, and we then use them as green fertilizers, bringing it down into our soils, increasing the fertility and sequestering CO2, if we're not using that opportunity in agricultural politics, which we support with billion, billions of taxpayers' money, this is a huge lost opportunity. But I know that Franz Timmermans is fighting on the same side of history in that regard. Um, I would like to uh, have a view on the energy systems and the energy policy. Um, first of all, what I miss very much in the debate is the question of consumption reduction. We're talking a lot about replacing uh, energy sources uh, through renewables uh, or even biogenic substances. But the overall question, how can we reduce our consumption, should be, I think, answered first. And there, I really appreciate also the parts of the programs which talk about insulation of houses. Because this is not only creating jobs on a local level, on a regional level. It's not big multinationals usually uh, uh, rebuilding or reshaping uh, single households. But it's more or less uh, the, the economies next, next to our doors, our neighbors, and so on. And this is going to reduce the energy bills of people. So it's directly countering energy poverty. And if we're even able to combine that with solar power energy on their roofs, we're not just diversifying the production of energy, but we're also creating little incomes for households across Europe. I believe that this is a point where we should focus on more than the big infrastructure projects, which are partly also needed, but I would say should not always be the first priority. And also we have to make sure that we're not trapped by green looking projects, which with a closer look are not that green anymore, like a very prominent one. We really have to make sure that subsidies under the Green Deal don't go towards nuclear energy. Even if nuclear energy may be a bit less CO2 emitting than other uh, energy sources. But I mean, after Fukushima or Chernobyl, there's no need to talk about the dangers that we also face with nuclear. And nevertheless, 
on the market without subsidies, nuclear can't compete with renewables anyway. So this would be a lost and stranded investment. But also hydrogen. Yeah, sure. The production of hydrogen with an overflow of energy coming from windmills, basically offshore windmills, is a useful way to use that electricity that we can't or up to now are not able to transport across the continent. But as I see also the gas industry is very keen on talking a lot about hydrogen, arguing to enlarge the gas systems across Europe for fossil in the moment with the, let's say, green speech of green hydrogen. Well, in the moment, 95% of all hydrogen is produced with fossil fuels. And in that case, it even makes more sense for the climate if we use the fossil fuel directly rather than producing hydrogen first and then using the hydrogen. We are losing too much in that process. Or carbon capture and storage. Uh, yes, there may be a future in mineralized carbon capture and storage, but to use gas caverns to store uh, CO2 in big amounts, this also buries quite a danger for the population. Because if these ca caverns, gas caverns, ever open up, we will have major impacts on our society, up to hundreds and thousands of people dying in that uh, cloud of CO2. Last okay. but not least, uh, hydropower, also in hydropower, I'm not completely against hydropower, but what we see, especially on the Balkans, that a lot of small rivers with not enough stream, with not enough water, are now put into pipes, in hydropower pipes, uh, also within a green speech, and there, very often, the damage is much bigger than we gain. And for the European Investment Bank, my message would have been, do a climate check for every single investment. I have a lot of cases where it does not seem that this has been done, uh, but the EIB is not contributing today. So I keep this for my next discussion. Okay, herzlichen Dank, Thomas Weitz there, MEP. Um, yes, indeed, I'm sure uh, the European Investment Bank would say that it does a climate audit before uh, it starts lending money, or it will start doing at least a climate audit. Can I go back to Celine with a, a first quick question? what you're talking about free public transport which would benefit women and poorer people instead i've been to seattle i think a lot of people have seen what's happened in Tallinn and in luxembourg and they've seen the benefits of free public transport but governments will have to pay for that and i'm just wondering now in the light of the covid 19 crisis whether they can afford now with um with large population large parts of their population without work to subsidize public transport, no matter how beneficial that would be. Celine, unmute, unmute your microphone and help us with that question, please. Sure. Um, well, I think we always have to compare the benefits of uh, uh, a positive measure for the climate with business as usual and the cost of business as usual. If you look at the cost to health systems about air pollution, uh, you realize that in a way, if you did free public transport and if you massively brought down air pollution, you would actually have a saving because those healthcare costs are also uh, putting a high burden on the budgets of the member states. So I think that that's one uh, first element. The second is, as I said, we think that there needs to be a tax reform we set ourselves a goal to have an increasing portion of total tax revenue coming from taxing pollution. At the moment, we are failing to do that, barring some of the member states. So we also need to mobilize new resources uh, so that we have additional FTT is another one that is being discussed right now, the financial transaction tax. So we can have the margin of maneuvers to also uh, have new measures that will be costing money before uh, we okay. can read the Celine, benefits merci of for that. that. Uh, Franz Timmermans, staying with COVID-19, um, do you think the crisis caused by the coronavirus with tens of thousands of lives lost and millions of livelihoods ruined, do you think it's going to make the Green Deal more difficult to implement? And I know you said it makes it more urgent and all that kind of stuff, but the practical reality is that you are looking at surging unemployment, massive public spending problems and then people might prioritize a green Europe a little bit lower down. But we also need massive uh, investment, uh, massive investment. And then it is up to us, the policymakers on a national level, local level, 
European level, I would even say global level, to make the right choices in the investments uh, we have to make. And we have to make sure that we combine the long-term goals with short-term results. That's why I'm a strong believer, of, I've worked on this very hard, uh, uh, in the renovation wave we've presented. The renovation wave, Thomas talked about that also uh, earlier, the renovation wave means that we're going to reduce the energy consumption needed to heat uh, 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 for heating of our houses and the cooling of our buildings and houses um, uh, by renovating, by refitting, by uh, installing solar panels, by insulation, by heat pumps, etc. And also around the housing, create a better infrastructure for cycling, for um, uh, public transport, etc. By doing that, you immediately create jobs, you immediately create opportunity, you also invest in te technological innovation, you allow for a huge buy-in of new materials, so the price will go down, uh, and so you achieve short-term uh, uh, results uh, whilst working on the long-term goal of reducing the energy consumption. So I think that's a perfect example of uh, how we can stimulate um, uh, uh, jobs uh, being created, how we can stimulate recovery, and at the same time, uh, work towards being climate neutral by 2050. And uh, while I have you, Franz, going to put a question that we got in from the audience from Emma Bacchini. Uh, leaving no one behind applied in practice. How can the EU encourage citizens involvement in the energy transition in a paradigm shift from being consumers to being a part of the production system. That's from Emma Bacchini, and it's on your screen at the moment, I think, Franz. Well, Emma, uh, you know, um, you already see it, the take up of solar panels. Um, sometimes people find it complicated, a bit expensive sometimes, and don't know uh, who could help them. But the uptake is huge. Um, let me quote one example, a country you wouldn't expect. In Poland, um, solar panels have become so popular that uh, it, it's created a new <laughs> Uh, growth element in their economy. And if you have solar panels, you generate your own energy, you feed it back into the system. The more we do that, the more self-reliant you will be, uh, and the more you will understand uh, the nature of the energy you produce and consume. Um, if if we, we organize that well, and we combine it also in the renovation wave, then we can avoid uh, the risk of energy poverty, because, you know, um, uh, uh, energy subsidies on fossil fuels will have to come down so some so if we don't uh, reduce energy consumption energy might uh, become uh, unaffordable to the weaker people in our society we have to avoid that at all costs and uh, uh, reducing consumption uh, making people aware that they can produce their own energy uh, creating uh, ways in which energy can be pooled in 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 city areas etc um, it is a way of, of doing what Emma wants us to do. And, and I, I, I see this happening in quite a number of places in Europe. Uh, but we also have to use uh, digitization and the newest technology uh, to create the most uh, efficient and effective way of implementing this. But this is happening and, and, and we will certainly encourage it. We will certainly try and invest in it as much as we can. And because they're not here, I have to you know, uh, involve the uh, European Investment Bank in this. They were one of the first to invest in these sorts of developments, and they are becoming really uh, Europe's green bank, uh, and they need and they deserve to be uh, um, uh, recommended for that. Uh, briefly, before I come to an extra question for uh, Thomas, um, do you like the idea that um, the founder of Tesla uh, is talking about that every home has its own battery? so that it can store energy locally without having to use the grid at all. Do you think that's for, can that be achieved in the next five or 10 years? France. Yes, it can. Uh, and we don't need the owner of Tesla for that. Uh, we can do this in <laughs> Europe. Uh, we're, we're moving really fast in this. I, I know some um, experimental um, setups in, in my own country, in Delft, where a car, a battery uh, driven car, uh, is also the energy source for the home when it comes home at night. So, uh, yes, um, uh, the back and forth, you know, the, the thing is with, with uh, renewable energy, uh, you cannot really plan when it is generated. So with renewable energy, wind and solar, you will have always have to have a backup, always have to have storage um, uh, facilities and batteries are, uh, are essential for that. And if you're if you can store when you generate a lot of solar energy, uh, you can lead it back to the grid but you can also store it in your car and your car can give it back to you whenever you need it in your home at night or so 
Very good answer. A lot of us have, of course, cars parked outside that we don't use very much, and especially over the last nine months that we haven't used much at all. And I'm talking about the Lynham household, especially here. Um, question for Thomas Weitz, MEP, and it's from Luke Bass, who is from the IUCN. Unfortunately, I don't know what the IUCN stands for. Luke's question is, we need to avoid negative impacts of the EU Green Deal on the rest of the world, exporting even more of the effects of our unsustainable overconsumption. What can be done? Honest trade deals are a key element. That's from Luke Bass from the IUCN. Thomas. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, look, um, uh, you're already pointing into the right direction. Uh, we're we're living on a, on a, on one planet all together, and if we talk about solving the climate crisis, it makes no sense to actually end looking at the effects of our policies uh, right at the end of EU borders. Uh, even more, we have to acknowledge that parts of what we do today are having a heavy impact uh, on other regions of the world. Uh, I may come back to the agricultural question, just look at the amounts of soy that Europe imports uh, and calls it a successful agricultural business in stuffing the soy into chicken and pork in Europe, which we then partly export to China. I think these kind of business models should really re remain in the past, but also like palm oil, which is heavily imported also by Europe, not just for animal fodder, especially the calves uh, instead of milk, but also, you know, for industrial use, uh, we have to have a look on the effects and actually put European standards also on the imported produce. And so I very much welcome the idea of the Commission uh, with the so-called CO2 border adjustment mechanism, which could have a positive effect on other regions of the world uh, uh, as well. Because meaning if you want to import into the European Union toll free, you may change your production model towards a more CO2 neutral path. Uh, but this uh, principle could also be enlarged to other products uh, uh, that should apply to the new way and green way of doing also industrial production. Uh, even more, we have to look also on the effects of European exports on economies on other countries. Uh, or again, uh, questions for our, our agricultural policy as well. Uh, if we, with our subsidized, uh, comparably cheap produce, because with heavy taxpayer support, uh, actually downplay or uh, reduce or have a negative impact on the local production. This is also, in, in, in the summary, a very negative effect on the climate if we actually kill local produce uh, uh, in, and, and replacing it with imported stuff from Europe. So your question comes very timely also to the negotiations around the Mercosur agreement, where we have to make sure that the environment environmental impact is looked at honestly and taken into account. And if these countries are not ready to sign up to a minimum standard, then we should really rethink whether we shall do these kind of trade agreements. Uh, okay, Th Thomas, of course, the Mercosur deal is by no means done and dusted. I'm sure there's quite a few farmers uh, in Europe that don't want that deal to go ahead. Um, in France and Ireland is the two countries that I can think of. Can I move to Celine with a question? Uh, you can unmute yourself there, Celine. Um, how important was the election this month of Joe Biden to the White House? And did the four-year presidency of Donald Trump do any damage to meeting EU green targets? Well, obviously, uh, we had for four years in, in the White House a, a president that uh, really tried to lower uh, standards, environmental standards, in every possible way. Uh, and I think the first damage that's been done is the, to the future competitiveness of the U.S. economy. Uh, but obviously, that made it uh, for... Uh, uh, you know, a much harder sell for the European Commission to say to member states, we need to be more ambitious because obviously every time the answer was, and what is the US doing? But I also think there were some benefits because I do think that we have started to see a co-leadership in the world between the EU and China. And in a way, the fact that the US was a little bit set aside has enabled uh, a new uh, opportunities for Europe to really uh, strike that partnership with China. And I really hope it's going to remain with the Biden administration 
I have followed UNFCCC negotiations for a very long time, and having the U.S. back in is on one way wonderful. On another, we've seen the U.S. sometimes, also at the WTO, uh, participate in negotiations just to slow them down. So I really hope that Joe Biden will be able to negotiate a green deal and convince part of uh, the Republic sorry, Republican Party, who have uh, no intention to move forward on climate change. And one area which might be a sweet spot for the EU and the US to cooperate on is the circular economy, because you don't have the same denialism in the United States regarding the circular economy than what you have on climate change. Okay, Celine, uh, Franz Timmermans, I know you're a politician, but uh, did you open a bottle of champagne three weeks ago? Well, I certainly had a beer. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't like champagne, frankly. Brunch um, beer from Limburg. Uh, I certainly had a beer. <laughs> yes. Um, no, obviously, um, I'm thrilled. I mean, my, my links with the Democratic Party go way, way back in the international progressive movement. Um, I, I had the pleasure of, of, of getting to know some of lead, the leading Democrats. I admire people like Bill Clinton, but also Barack Obama and Joe Biden. And John Kerry, who's now going to be my colleague, is a very close personal friend. Uh, so, you know, it, it, for, for all these reasons, I'm thrilled. And I'm especially thrilled that one of the first things uh, President-elect Biden said was that he would come back to the Paris Agreement, which, of course, is, a, is of a huge importance to all of us. Um, so he will do that by executive order. And by the end of February, it will be uh, a fact. Uh, so, yeah, that, that really is reason to, to uncork a couple of bottles. OK, whether it's Brandt uh, beer, uh, which is my favourite in the Netherlands, or, or a bottle of champagne, though I'm sure other bubbly wines are also available, Celine. Um, question now, again, I'll stay with you, Franz, if I may, from Maria Grazia Montella from Integrim Lab. Her question is, and I'll put this to Franz, how is the Green Deal planning to put in place strategies for those countries who still rely a lot on carbon and fossil fuel, like Poland, for example, from uh, Maria Grazia. Well, we, we have uh, what we call the Just Transition Fund, but that's not enough. I mean, I think uh, combining the Just Transition Fund with a Just Transition mechanism, we can mobilize uh, more or less 100 uh, um, uh, million uh, euro. Uh, on top of that, um, um, uh, one billion euro, of course. On top of that, uh, it is important that we um, uh, reorient uh, some of the structural funds into going into the same uh, uh, direction. But at the same time, uh, even in a country like Poland, people now know, even in, in, this, in this government that said it would promote coal, they've come to the conclusion that coal has no future. So even the Polish government now has a scheme to get out of the coal production by 2049. It's late, but still, what I find important is not the date, but the fact that they know this is coming. Uh, and I, I think this is um, of huge importance um, that 30, 30 remaining coal mining regions in Europe all know that there's no future in coal. So now it's our collective responsibility to offer um, a better future uh, without coal. And that's going to be a, a daunting challenge, uh, but it can be done. It can be done for several reasons. First of all, because the economy is, is transforming anyway. So we can use this transformation also to bring something new in those areas. Secondly, because of demographics, uh, we will need everyone uh, um, in our economy. So the issue is not uh, of having too many people. The issue is uh, matching people with skills. So we will have, a, have to have a massive program of skilling and reskilling of our workforce across the European Union so that they can be part of this new economy. And then if we make the right choices and the right investments, there is a bright future for these regions. I'm, I'm really pretty confident because I'm from a coal mining region myself. So we have some experience uh, in that, also personal experience, uh, because usually these regions um, have very good infrastructure, physical infrastructure, especially rail, which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, one of the most important um, uh, transportation modes of the future. Um, they very often also have a huge a very advantageous technical infrastructure with a lot of engineers and a lot of uh, high-tech facilities. You know, when you talk about coal mines, you think about the miners, but it's a whole 
uh, economic ecosystem uh, with all sorts of levels uh, of uh, economic activity. So yeah, I think I think I mean it's going to be tough. Any transformation is tough, but the the issue is our whole economy is going to go through a transformation, and we we have an opportunity to offer new possibilities for coal mining regions. And uh, let's get started immediately in Silesia and in other parts uh, of Europe where this is needed. And and also and one more sentence about this. We have a lot of um, ask of local and regional uh, um, uh, um, politicians, uh, uh, governors, mayors, but also local and regional economic structures to be part of this. They know this is coming. They want to be part. They're not resisting it. They want us to do it right. And I'm, I, I hope I can put all my efforts into this in the next couple of years uh, because I want to do it better than it was done in my own home region 50 years ago. Well, I'm very pleased to say uh, that we have questions coming in. Uh, they are not shy uh, audiences today. Sometimes you get very shy audiences. Um, if you are going to comment on Twitter, please use the hashtag uh, investing in Europe, all one word, obviously. Uh, and you can also check out the Twitter uh, feeds for EM International, at EM International and at EIB. Um, question for Thomas. Uh, uh, you're, uh, you're Austrian. Uh, we have no Germans uh, uh, on our today, which is unusual uh, for the biggest country in Europe. Uh, are countries like Germany talking out of both sides of their face when they talk about Energiewende and energy transformation, but then pay for a second giant gas pipeline from Russia? Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, th that, cri that criticism is very valid and it's not only shown uh, through that question on energy transition and investing into a fossil infrastructure, which really is in danger to be a stranded investment. Um, you can also see that in the question of, well, uh, trying to really fix the climate problem within their own country, trying to be at the forefront uh, of the, I would say, green industrial revolution, but still uh, uh, trying to, to, to keep a, a trade um, uh, in, in, their, in their core of, of, of their policy and to keep up uh, trade agreements that serve them uh, with uh, ore, uh, minerals, uh, where, where exactly the production and the extraction uh, is very harmful to environment, uh, has a lot of social impacts in the region, but is also very harmful to climate. But I have a certain understanding as well, because uh, Germany tries to balance uh, their, their um, uh, industrial uh, needs, their job markets. Uh, uh, Germany is heavily depending on exports. Uh, and I think we have to have a close look there uh, if Germany is really complying fully uh, on, uh, to what they actually announce. Uh, so um, I see, but I see a lot of positive signals also coming from Germany. Uh, this may have to do with uh, excellent polls uh, of the Green Party, which, which push, I would say, all political actors to closely look whether their policy is really stringent uh, and, uh, and their conclusions are serving the, the right purpose always into the right direction. But I mean, to point out on that question is timely, uh, but you can find actually that very same contradiction in all the big industrial countries of the Union, maybe France combined with nuclear uh, or even countries like Austria with the big markets uh, in the former East European countries, uh, where you also see that within our home country, we portray ourselves as very green, and we are in many sectors, but if you go towards the Western Balkans, you see that this, these kind of uh, um, uh, pleas are not always kept. Merci. Danke schön, Thomas. Uh, so not just slagging off your big neighbors, just slagging off your, your, your own Austrian popular. Thank you very much. Uh, if you could unmute yourself, Silly, and I have a question for you. Uh, it's from uh, Richard uh, Richard Blaze or Richard Blay, I'm not sure how it's pronounced. Um, and it is for you. I'm going to give it to you, Celine, if I may. How will you deal with the economic changes that the European Green Deal will imply at a local level? Job reconversion, etc. Do you believe the just transition mechanism will be sufficient? That's from Richard. Well, clearly, uh, the funding that's been uh, currently set aside in the just transition mechanism will not be sufficient. So uh, I hope that uh, at some point uh, member states come back to the table and start putting, uh, you know, aligning the discourse with the actions in terms of setting 
enough money aside to guarantee a just transition. But I think, you know, uh, you're totally right to ask that question about the local level. Actually, our member, the Stockholm Environmental Institute, has shown research about past restructures. And it's clear that those that have been the most successful in terms of supporting equitable outcomes for affected populations have been those where local authorities have been put uh, at the center. And uh, if you look at the capacity of local authorities, of course, we don't have necessarily the same capacity because they don't necessarily have the same tax base. Uh, sometimes, you know, depending on the country, they might not have a lot of autonomy. So we really need to make sure that European funding, but also recommendations for structural reforms to member states, make sure that local authorities are really empowered financially, uh, but also legally uh, to play a very strong role in the just transition. And then last but not least, as that was said, creating new opportunities, not just uh, uh, helping uh, people facing uh, potential negative outcomes is really uh, important. And ensuring equitable outcomes on all the policies of the Green Deal will be uh, as well paramount. Merci, C Céline. I, thankfully, we have loads of questions. I'm going to put one, if I may, to Franz Timmermans um, uh, from the European Commission. It, it is from Guillemar Gutierrez Pascual. My, uh, my Spanish is not great, but Guimar Gutierrez Pascual. Now, France, the question is, are the European institutions, including the Green and the Green Economy in the future treaty or agreement with the United States? He's talking about TTIP, I presume, uh, and uh, whether that's something that you think should be or will be built into any TTIP, because the Americans will be pretty slow to lock into something like that, I'm guessing, France. Yes, I'm, uh, we need to be realistic about this, um, uh, where we may uh, come very close to the Americans in terms of what we want out of uh, the next COP in Glasgow, uh, how we're going to implement uh, the, um, the Paris Agreement. I think on, on the issue of trade, uh, we will still have a couple of really tough nuts to crack, uh, and this will be one of them. Um, I, I, I'm not sure there's going to be I mean, the, the, the issue of, of multilateralism will be back and the, the willingness to cooperate will be back uh, more than before. And I think what is fundamental for Europe is that um, uh, uh, I suspect um, a president like Biden will go back to what was uh, the normality for decades, namely that it, the Americans understand that it's also in an American interest that Europe is united. Uh, we only had four years in, 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 in a long period of, let's say, 50, 60 years. We only had four years when administration uh, really thought it was in their interest uh, to split Europe. Um, uh, that, that, that's going to make a huge difference in our relationship, uh, uh, that this idea that um, uh, splitting Europe will be good for the US is gone. But uh, some of the uh, tough issues in trade will remain. Um, our agriculture is differently uh, structured. Our ideas about trade uh, are sometimes different. And um, I think um, if you if you want to see a model of a trade agreement uh, or a trade negotiation that I hope will become uh, a template for other negotiations, it's our talk with New Zealand, uh, where especially uh, high environmental standards and social standards are the, sort of the core element in the trade agreement we're trying to conclude. Thank you, Franz. I'm, I'm going to go back to Thomas Weitz, who talked about, um, I think you talked about uh, uh, hydrogen power. Um, maybe you, in your shopping list, you didn't include it. I've got a question from Christoph Peschke. Christoph Peschke, whose question is, we should initially use hydrogen mainly as a chemical substance industry. Hydrogen production is electricity intensive. Is this considered in the prioritization for funding or projects? Question from Christoph Peschke, and it is for Thomas Meiken. Uh, thank you, Christoph. Uh, I mean, the last part of your question, how much it is or will be included into funding and projects, uh, this is a question for the Commission. But in general, yes, you are perfectly right. It's very electricity intensive. That's why I think uh, the, the 
it, it's useful uh, to, to produce hydrogen with an overflow of wind energy, offshore energy, because it just happens if there's heavy wind that uh, there's so much electricity available close uh, to the shores uh, that we can't really um, uh, spread across Europe. I mean, we would need uh, electricity lanes of this thick. Um, the point is uh, that you're also right, hydrogen uh, is an alternative first, I would say, for industrial uh, uh, productions like steel industry, as an example. Uh, but again, uh, the question is, what is that hydrogen produced from? And where does the electricity stem from? So it makes no sense to produce electricity out of a coal fired power plant first and then use it to produce hydrogen, then transport the hydrogen, and then use it for transportation. It could be uh, uh, useful also uh, in, uh, for trains uh, to um, uh, replace diesel trains that we still have across Europe, not everywhere, but we still have a lot. Uh, but, and then maybe the next step could be trucks where hydrogen could, could be useful. Uh, hydrogen for cars uh, due to technical constraints, due to the uh, high need of, of uh, technical um, uh, means uh, is, from my uh, standpoint, uh, uh, is not very useful to actually develop an infrastructure for that. I know the car industry likes it because you, you can uh, uh, tank your, your car uh, uh, at the petrol station and you have a long reach, but uh, we know also about the dangers and also the technical uh, circumstances are not so much in favor of using hydrogen in cars. So I think you're perfectly right, industrial use first. Uh uh, vielen Dank, Thomas. Uh, let's go back to Celine. Uh, Celine, if you could unmute your microphone. Um, tell us what you think about the idea of a carbon border adjustment tax, whether it can work. And I, I can see um, I can see uh, Franz Timmermans' brain thinking about this one as well. I might put that one to you in due course, Franz. Uh, Celine, first of all, to you, carbon border adjustment tax. Well... There's a reason why none of those mechanisms have ever been put in place. They are really quite complex. Uh, and we are in touch with many experts that look at all the complexities about the design of those measures. So they bring environmental integrity both within Europe. So they are not considered as an excuse as part of the discussions about the ATS review, but also to make sure that they truly act as an encouragement for other countries to be uh, increasing their climate ambition. And also they will be quite politically de divisive. We know that uh, China and India are extremely worried and are saying, if you go too far with uh, this proposal, you know, this will uh, severely hurt the UNFCCC negotiations. So we really hope that the commission can really have a collaborative approach uh, and, and use diplomacy to be speaking with partners, with, uh, with key partners in terms of the climate negotiations about uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism. We also want to say that there are alternatives. I think the product policy and our product standards, if we manage to have high product standards that take into account and disincentivize uh, carbon use, material use, and if we apply them also to our imports, as well as to our domestic products, we can also have uh, shelter our industry and build further competitiveness of our industry by making eventually those product standards, the worldwide standards. We've done this on cars, we've done this with reach. So this is now the next step in terms of uh, improving our product standards to reach exactly those goals to have sustainable competitiveness with Europe in the leading position. You're muted. You're muted. There we go. Now, can you hear me now, Franz? Sorry about that. <laughs> yes. Very quiet is very rare. So enjoy the moment. Enjoy the <laughs> uh, Franz, question for you. It's also get rare to get a, um, a muted Dutchman as well. Uh, carbon border adjustment tax. Easy peasy, according to Celine. Not. <laughs> no, no, it's extremely complicated. Uh, we're working on it. Um, uh, I, I was talking to the Chinese about this this morning, and I... I, I continue to talk with our international partners. And, and, and let me say just in a couple of words how we see it. 
uh, how we see it is that in certain sectors, um, no, let me begin differently. We have all committed to the Paris Agreement. And if we take the right steps to go into the direction of fulfilling those commitments, a carbon border adjustment mechanism is not necessary. But if we do that and some of our partners don't, then we have a double risk. We have a risk of uh, carbon leakage, um, industry leaving and going elsewhere, uh, or we have a risk of um, uh, not being a level playing field, uh, a distortion of competition. And uh, in certain areas, but we have to be extremely specific and we have to look uh, very, very closely at the different sectors, whether it's feasible and then whether it's uh, not just feasible, whether it's also effective. Uh, we're, we're in the middle of this analysis right now. So for certain sectors, uh, that this might uh, be necessary. Uh, at the same time, we will be looking at products um, and at standards. And we, we are coming forward with proposals uh, in that area as well in the next couple of months. So um, uh, we're doing both same things. But I, I, I would assume that in certain areas, I'm not going to specify today which, a carbon border adjustment mechanism may be necessary. Uh, the thing is that um, uh, many are asking for it, some for good reason and others more for protectionist reasons. And we have to be careful that we don't um, uh, um, um, do this for the wrong reasons. There are very per there are very good reasons to do it if, if we can specify it and etc. Uh, but we have to be careful that this does doesn't take us into a direction that is self-defeating for everyone especially for the poorest countries uh, on this planet. Uh, Bedankt, Frans. Well, let's uh, go to Thomas uh, Weitz, uh, who can unmute his uh, microphone um, and maybe give us your final thoughts as we come to the end of the session, Thomas. Thank you, Joe. So basically, I think the big question is, how do we get out of this economical crisis that we have due to the COVID-19 impact? And the second point is, we're first time in European history. We all stand together. We take loans together on the international market to use that money to support citizens, to support economy across the continent. So the question is not, do we actually have the money or use the money? But the question is just, how are we using the money? And taking these loans means putting a huge burden on future generations, a financial burden. And I think it's our duty to invest the money in a way that serve future generations that will have to pay back that money to keep the planet lively for future generations. This is just our duty. And so it's not a question whether more jobs or less jobs, this or that way. We have to invest into a green, climate-friendly future because future generations will have to pay back. Uh, herzlichen Dank, uh, Thomas Weitz, der uh, Member of the European Parliament uh, in Austria. And Celine Chavaria, let's have your final thoughts, please. Well, I think we are very fortunate in Europe to have the Green Deal. I think, as uh, VP Timmerman said, we have a unique opportunity to put sustainable well-being and equity at the center of the European projects, to have uh, by doing that, to bring people of Europe together, you know, for us, it's the Europe, it's the new moonshot, right? Living well within planetary boundaries, eating well, having good housing, having good mobility uh, and lifestyles that allow us to have good living standards, but also protect the interests of future generations. And for, for this, we need indeed to spend our money wisely to build the economy of the future. We need to keep up with the structural reforms and the common agricultural policy is paramount. We need to reopen the debate. And then last but not least, we need to make sure we work with civil society, with SMEs, with all the different stakeholders together to experiment with new ways of doing things, innovating also socially, so we can reach our goals of carbon neutrality by 2050, with everyone feeling in Europe that they have benefited from it. Merci, Celine. And let's go to uh, Franz Timmermans with his final thoughts on this very important subject. Well, what we do in the next couple of years is going to determine whether we achieve uh, what we need to do, and that is to get the climate crisis under control, the biodiversity crisis under control, uh, and to avoid uh, the Industrial Revolution from derailing and, and creating a small group of winners and a huge group of losers. 
So I think there's a bit of a scary thought that you know we're at the reins now. We 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 have the responsibility to take the measures in the next couple of years that will determine whether we succeed or not. I find that terribly scary, but also really challenging and interesting. Um, I I I I've become a grandfather uh, four months ago, uh, and um, uh, holding holding my grandson for the first time, this thought came to me that. You know, if I screw up, uh, he's in trouble. Uh, when he's an adult, he'll be in trouble. So if we, I mean, I'm the oldest one on this call, certainly. Uh, um, uh, I'm going to be 60 years of age next year. Um, if we, as a generation, screw up, uh, we have a huge responsibility. So we can't afford to screw up. That's all I want to say today. <laughs> Well, on that very future-looking uh, thought, I will leave it there. Um, and thank you very much, Franz uh, Timmermans. Uh, I, I, it's there. Thomas Oestros from the European Investment Bank couldn't join us. He's still in a management meeting at the EIB. So he missed a pretty decent discussion. I certainly learned a lot. Uh, on, on behalf of all of the team uh, from the European Movement International, who spent a lot of time getting this together, like to thank you. Don't forget, this video will be put back up on the website investinginthefuture.eu. Investinginthefuture.eu. Put it all back together. Thank you, Franz Timmermans. Thank you, um, Celine Chavria. Thank you, um, Thomas Weitz. Thomas Weitz uh, from uh, the European Parliament. On behalf of me, Joe Lynham, and the rest of the team, stay safe out there, and hopefully you'll have a Christmas. Bye bye.